The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome back to NDE Radio, brought to you by IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Today we are continuing a fascinating story uh, from our guest, Nancy von Elfen. And she is, uh, if you have not heard the first part of her story, go to our past shows button and listen to last week's, last Monday's show. Nancy's story is uh, really amazing and very important, I think, because it's not this week about or last week about NDEs. Rather, it's about the sorts of uh, experiences that people have all the time and write off as a coincidence or uh, some bizarre thing that just doesn't have any uh, intrinsic meaning of its own. She was brought from the point of uh, being an agnostic to the point of being a believer by a series of events. And as I quoted in in the first show, uh, uh, four lines from the poem by Francis Thompson, uh, called the hound of heaven. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthian ways of my own mind and in the midst of tears. Nancy pointed out that this took uh, six months rather than many years uh, for, for the maturity that came out of these amazing experiences. And where we left off, she had just had a dream, having asked God if reincarnation is real, which is always a question of mine, who was I? And the le- the letters she got back, uh, or the name she got back, letter by letter by letter, and three times were just like, and this won't mean anything unless you listen to the first show, just like the cards in my mind in Ben's video, in Ben and Breed Love's video, and it's spelled out Absalom, Absalom, Absalom. And then Nancy grabbed an unopened Bible, opened to the very page at one shot in 2 Samuel that tells the story of David's beloved third son, Absalom, who rebelled against David and and died when his long hair got caught in a tree, which leads us to welcoming you back, Nancy, (laughs) with with (laughs) the second part of the story. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, so we left off on... um... One of the longer aspects of uh, my what I call my core experiences that happened within these six months, and I I say that because um, this first part where I asked God uh, if reincarnation was real, and if so, who was I? And I received beyond a shadow of a doubt. I know now that you know, and I knew then that God was, had given me an answer. So I popped up in bed, opened my eyes and realized that and opened the Bible to that story and whatnot. But uh, trailing from that, um, I was given confirmation three times because I refused to believe that I could have been Absalom after reading this story. So I knew God gave me an answer and I thanked God for the answer. Uh, But I I told God, I said, (laughs) I I think you might've made a mistake. (laughs) You know, I could not have been this person who was number one, male, number two, Jewish, number three, a murderer, uh, number four, you know, uh, just outright vengeful. And I am nothing like that. I'm female. I was brought up Christian, uh, I wouldn't hurt a fly. I'm the kind of person that just shoes bugs out of the house. Um, you know, I did not see that I could have been that person. So uh, n- only a few days later, Lee, I was outside mowing the lawn. It was early springtime. <clears throat> and I got around to the, the the back of the yard and I was ducking under this bank of trees, baby trees that we have. Uh, as I always do, never have a problem. And as I had been mowing the lawn, I'd been thinking about this and how unusual all these things were that were happening to me. And, you know, was it real? Was it not? And uh, it began to feel much more real, of course. Um, But I couldn't believe that I'd been Absalom. 
And so as I was mowing under these trees, I said to God, if I was this Absalom character, you got to give me a confirmation. And as I said that, the tree, (laughs) this is the best way to put it, the tree grabbed my hair. Mm. And, you know, I I usually wear this ponytail kind of high on my head. And it was as if someone had grabbed me by the ponytail. And again, these were baby trees. I'd never had a problem getting my hair stuck in the tree, nothing like that. But it was a good yank on my ponytail. And I knew immediately that that was the confirmation Mm. because Absalom had died, as you mentioned, uh, when he was fleeing his father's troops in the woods of Ephraim and his long hair that he was known for got caught in the branches of this tree. His donkey rode out from under him and his father's troops caught up to him and speared him and killed him. And by all accounts, it was pretty brutal and they threw him in a pit, and that was the, the end of Absalom. Mm. But I know it wasn't the end of that soul that lived a life as Absalom. Uh, and as that, as that happened, and I knew that that was the confirmation, and the association came like lightning, uh, I also felt a humorous chuckle between myself and God. And almost as soon as the, the, the hair had grabbed my tree and that transpired, it released. I mean, I didn't have, didn't put my hand up by my hair, nothing. It just released. And so that was the first confirmation that I received. Now you had reminded me, um, that about the caterpillar in Disney's version of Alice in Wonderland was also named Absalom. So uh, how did you make that connection? Well, uh, to be honest with you, Lee, I haven't seen that version. So you, you may have seen more of it than I did. Oh, I went and looked it up and it, it, in the, um, in the original version, in the original story, uh, the caterpillar is kind of a pompous perched on a, on a toadstool and proclaiming, you know, um, uh, you know, like almost like a politician yeah. in Disney's version. It is a character that is obviously infinitely wise and godlike. And the question that he asks Alice is, who are you? And <laughs> <laughs> and not only which the question, that question is also asked in um, um, in the in the book, but in the movie version. Alice is accompanied by Tweedledum and Tweedledee, and they unroll a scroll that the caterpillar provides, which contains the entire history of Alice's existence. Wow. And tells her who she is. Well, this I, cat- I'm, this I'm, caterpillar I'm, is all wise. You've got to see it. And uh, yeah, what, I wonder where that came, who, whose mind that sprang from. Yeah, why, why Absalom? Why was this caterpillar named Absalom? And the, the thing that uh, the, the, the two, the duty that is laid upon Alice's shoulders is that she must take the sacred sword and slay the Jabberwocky. So I, at some point, have to ask you whether you've slay, slayed the Jabberwocky yet, or does that come in your next lifetime? Well, I'm going to have to to ponder on that one a little bit, <laughs> and I definitely have to watch this Disney version because I I do believe nothing is a coincidence. And as you mentioned, the earlier version, both of them are appropriate, to be honest with you, because if you know the story of Absalom, you know that um, he ultimately was forgiven by his father, allowed back into the kingdom, but uh, he never felt that his father uh, was hard enough to uh, uh, on people who would come into the kingdom they would come in to to um plead their cases before david and then david would met out justice Mm -hmm. Uh, but he didn't really do a good job of that he was really soft and absalom didn't like that because obviously his brother was never punished by by david 
So um, he would go to the gates of the kingdom and wait right outside and talk to these people that were coming in to have their cases heard. And he would say, well, good luck. You know, my father's not going to give you any justice, you know, but if I were king, boy, I know how, I know really what they deserve. They deserve, you know, to get their head cut off or this or that. So he was not forgiving and he thought he knew better than David, you know, Mm. how to do things, even though here we have David, the exact opposite who was so soft on, on people and understanding, you know, he was a, a man after God's own heart because that's yeah. how God is. God is forgiving and understanding, but you know, um, so the comparison to that first, uh, Disney Absalom, or I'm sorry, uh, Lewis Carroll's Absalom, where he is, um, as you said, it sounds like he's kind of a politician. When I read that part in the Bible about Absalom, he sounded very politician like, So, um, and that was that life. And, you know, that uh, story of Lewis Carroll came earlier than the Disney story. So maybe this Disney story kind of aligns somehow with my life now. So I need to really look at that. I'm always looking and exploring and and finding new things about this whole soul evolution. Maybe God and Disney are working hand in hand. (laughs) Quite possible, quite possible. So now there are many, uh, you, you were, you were hard nut to crack, obviously the yes. hounds, the hounds were unleashed on you numerous times because even after this and your hair got caught in the tree and so forth, there was still came some further signs about this Absalom connection. Absolutely. You know, I, and, and that's sort of, uh, goes back to the title caught between heaven and earth, because I would at one minute, I would think that all of this was real and something was happening and divine. And the next minute I would be very grounded in my logic and my earthly self saying, come on, what are you, this, that's ridiculous. You don't think like that. You're more, you're, you're smarter than that. So I would vacillate between these two, uh, you know, differing thoughts about what was going on. So after the the tree had caught my hair, you know, a little while later, I found myself, nope, that was just a coincidence. Quit thinking (laughs) about something. Um, So later on, I found myself asking for yet another confirmation. Hmm. Um, And as this was going on, we were planning a family vacation to, uh, we wanted to go to a tropical beach. Uh, So we were, I was looking for all these tropical beach deals and whatnot. And Uh, One night I was sitting on the couch with my iPad doing just that. And I kept getting this pop-up that would not go away. And I was, you know, said something about it. And my husband's, let me see that. And he goes, wow, that's for Ireland. That would be really cool. And I'm like, nope, all of our kids, we already agreed tropical vacation. And he goes, but look at the deal. And it ends tonight at midnight. And it's only this much money, which was important to us because that was in our, you know, um, uh, less great financial years. <laughs> sure. So long story short, we decided without asking the kids who some of them were upset because they live in a, in Holland, which is also a rainy country as is Ireland. But nonetheless, we found ourselves in Ireland somewhere where I did not, I was not supposed to be when all of this, you know, started the first day that we're there, there's a, uh, it's in the boondocks really. And that's why it was so cheap. <laughs> so, <laughs> but there's this castle nearby and I don't know if your reader or your listeners have heard of it. Not many people have, but it was called Bunratty castle. And because it was our first day, we we're taking it easy. We decided we just head over there and then, you know, take, just do a, do a simple thing right around where we were. Everything else took two hours to drive to, but we were there. And we got to the castle. My kids went off in their directions. And my husband and I walked into the great room where there was a, there was hardly anybody at this castle, but there was a small group um, standing in this great room. It appeared to be a professor uh, type um, with maybe five or six uh, college students gathered around him. And they're standing under this tapestry and he's pointing at it and he's asking them, does, you know, anybody uh, know about the life of Absalom? This tapestry is depicting the life of Absalom. (laughs) And my husband who knew that I had just been asking for a confirmation again, 
um, both that we looked at each other and our jaws dropped. <laughs> and, you know, so I do believe that God sent me to Ireland for this confirmation. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's kind of funny. There's some funny things associated because I went on to tell the, the gentleman the story of Absalom and he uh, insisted I was a Bible scholar. But <laughs> at that time, that, that was the only story I'd read out of the Bible. Yeah, specializing in 2 Samuel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there, there's some other things attached to that, such as the tapestry being... Um, taken 30 years to, to weave. And this is not my book, but um, it was made in the Netherlands. And my husband happens to be from the Netherlands. And uh, we're living in South Jersey right now, which used to be called New Netherlands. Mm. <laughs> so some weird threads running through there. And I don't really know what they mean yet. But uh, weird enough was the second confirmation, you know. Uh, have you, uh, this is a little beside the point, but have you ever been to the cloisters? And, uh, um, the northern part of New York City. It's part of the Museum of uh, Modern Art, the uh, Museum of Art, and it's a medieval um, cloister setting. The Rockefellers, I think, brought over building parts from ancient buildings. Uh, so it's like a monastery or a cloister, and they have some of the most amazing tapestries, including one called um, the Unicorn Tapestry. Wow. Uh, which is a beautiful, beautiful piece. So oh, if you ever get over there, you should certainly go see it. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm close enough. So I'm going to make sure I, I get to that at some yeah. point. Uh, yeah. It's, but, um, now, speaking of art museums, you got a further. Well, I was going to say, I was gonna say speak, speaking, <laughs> speaking of museums, art, art and so forth. Um, the third confirmation that I received, and this time I had accepted that, yes, I was Absalom. And having started to investigate things, uh, you know, I uh, became familiar with the NDE community and what they'd said about the evolution of the soul. And I began to accept more that, hey, um, if I am who I am today and Absalom was this guy, which I might add, he did have some redeeming qualities, but, you know, did some horrible things. If that is true, then I have progressed quite a bit. <laughs> You know, so I was beginning to accept that and realize what maybe, you know, why, why reincarnation exists. But um, I needed to know if I, if that was true, if I was understanding it correctly. So by this third time, I started to ask for a confirmation on whether I was correct in my understanding. Mm. And uh, there was a point where same thing. I went to bed one night and I asked for a confirmation. And then I think it was just two days later that my sister and I were uh, headed up to Cleveland in Ohio, about a 40 minute drive to this flea market we'd always want to go to, an indoor flea market. And uh, we got there and they closed the doors because of overcrowding. So it was a Sunday. There wasn't else much else to do in Cleveland. It was raining. So my sister uh, suggested we go to the Cleveland Art Museum. Neither of us were particularly art fanatics, but we thought, okay, we'll go, go ahead and do that. We got there. She went her way. I went my way. Um, the very first painting that I looked at, uh, I sat on a bench and I was looking at it and trying to channel my inner art critic. Uh, and I saw a man in this painting look very pensive, uh, he had a crown dropped at his feet, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, okay, that, you know, I'll move on to the next one, but I want to see what this painting is. So I put my glasses on my face. I leaned for, you know, stepped forward and leaned and looked at the little placard. And it was David mourning the loss of Absalom. Mm. So, and, and I might add Lee on these, uh, all these, the second and the third confirmation uh, when I asked for those confirmations, I asked God to make it very specifically about Absalom so I could not mistake it. Because the tree, you know, my hair getting caught in the tree, that could have just been a weird thing that happened. So I asked for something very specifically on both those occasions about Absalom. And of course, the tapestry and the painting, how more specific can you get? You couldn't. I mean, talk about... Uh... 
these were very specific hounds that were pursuing you. <laughs> um, and, and, oh, Lee, I know that, uh, you know, I, I, psychologists will tell you, well, if you ask to see an orange car, you're going to see orange cars because it's your pers your perspective or your perception, right? But Absalom, come on. <laughs> You know, that's not something you see every day. Right. And, you know, the painting that you saw, David mourning the, the death of his son, shows that even though this was a rebellious son, like the prodigal son, David loved him so much that God loved David uh, as well. I mean, it was like a flowing of God's love through David to this Aaron's son, Absalom, which that is a, a further message as well. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, I've come to um, believe that part of the reasons I may have had these experiences is because the story of David and Absalom is sort of a, a mirror of this, the story of the prodigal son, which is, of course, the story of God and his children. And I wrote down about six things that, you know, that completely align. And, and if we have time, I'll go over that. But I did want to get to the very last thing that happened to me. I said there were three things in my core experiences, and that's true. Yes. The angels, the vision of Jesus, and the whole uh, reincarnation with the three successive um, confirmations. But uh, years later, Lee, when my husband and I had already moved to New Jersey, I was on the subject of reincarnation once again. And uh, once again, I was going to sleep at night and I said a prayer and it was very nonchalant, just as before. And I had been reading before that, that um, you know we've lived thousands and thousands of times according to this one particular author. And I went to bed thinking, man, that's really a lot of, a lot of times to live. Mm. And so, at the end of my prayer, I threw out to God, uh, you know, God, how many times have I lived? Very casual. And I went to sleep and I slept the entire night. But in the morning, I woke up and I can't say if I, you know, it seemed like I just woke up out of a deep sleep. And I did this thing where I rolled over in bed and I did this uh, stretching up on my arms, which was an unusual move for me. And I still can't explain it to this day, but I lifted my chin up and there was light streaming on the walls, which, you know, I just assumed was beautiful sunlight coming in, you know, the window in the morning. But I heard behind me right behind my left ear, very distinctly, there are seven in the ground. And <laughs> I knew that God had just given me an audible answer. And yeah. I was not frightened when I heard this voice. You know, I was not, I just felt happy. And I was almost like, wow, God's back. Yeah, he's talking to me again. Not that God had ever left, but I had been, you know, when you have those kind of experience that I, I had, you crave more of them. You know, mm. you don't want that connection to go away, such a strong connection. Of course. Um, at, that, at that particular moment, I was given that answer. And um, it was a strange answer because in my brain, my brain would have been expecting, you know, oh, two, you've lived 2,000 times, you know, or something like that. Uh, but I wasn't even given uh, a specific number. I was given there are seven in the ground. So later on, what I determined is, you know, God's pretty smart because he anticipated what I would have thought if, if I'd just been given the number seven or eight. I would have thought, well, does that include me or not? So now yeah. I'm stuck not knowing which number, but knowing that there's seven in the ground, I'm not in the ground yet. So I'm on my eighth life here on earth. Um, you know, you know what I think is so important about this too, is people do say, oh, well, you know, because there've been thousands of generations, I've lived thousands of lives. I think every life is terribly important to our final destination. And I think we probably choose our lives a whole lot more carefully than thousands of lives. I, you know, it makes perfect sense to me that you would have lived seven, now eight lives. Um, and that each each one is very important to defining that question that the uh, the, the caterpillar asks, yeah. who are you? 
who are you? Yeah. And, so. you know, I, I've heard uh, near-death experiencers say that who you were in a human incarnation, of course, is not uh, so important as what you learned in that incarnation. And I believe that to be true. Mm. Um, yeah. So, but, it, uh, but it also answers the, the, the big problem. The, the notion of reincarnation answers the question, how, how could uh, people be um, equally experienced if, if somebody's born to wealth and some poor child is born in the slums of Cairo, makes a short life living, picking garbage out of the Cairo dumps. How can you compare those two lives? And, and if everyone is given a shot, I mean, you were the son of a king in a previous yeah, life. Exactly. So yeah, it, it, I, I think it, we, it evens out. Yeah, and we learn from all these different lives, and I'm sure we're put into these different circumstances. You know, some say of our choosing, uh, but it's so much easier to learn by doing than just hearing or reading or however we might learn on the other side. You know, we come mm. here and we actually do things to learn, which is uh, a deeper kind of learning. Well, Nancy, we have just a couple minutes left. Why don't you uh, summarize what you feel you've learned so far from all of this? Well, Lee, I think uh, the most important thing, and I try to juxtapose this against what's happening today um, with so much strife and so, so forth going on, is for people to keep in mind that, you know, the suffering isn't going to last forever and it is a gift so use it to learn, um, you know, optimize that uh, aspect of your life. When you're, when you suffer, you, you learn. Um, so just know that and know that it isn't going to last forever. There is going to come a time when we all have learned enough or, uh, you know, learn to the ultimate uh, of being unconditional love ourselves, where we can fully reunite with God um, because we are all one, as Jesus himself told me. And reincarnation is a vehicle to uh, reach that point. So whether you believe in reincarnation or not, you know, it's it's there and it's happening. And it's a good thing, you know, because I think I really, truly believe God isn't going to lose one of his children. And especially if we are all one, we are inseparable. So the idea uh, also of hell, I think that's just a, a level of uh, where you're at on that evolutionary scale with your soul. But um, yeah, I think love it, love is always the answer, and that's what we're all headed toward. Yeah, it's always this this uh, dualism of love versus fear, or love versus cruelty. It's uh, it seems to be the nature of the world that we have this these two sides to the same coin, but the love side is, is the important one. And I think that's what we're here to learn, learn how to love. Yeah. And I used to believe, you know, early on in, in when I was analyzing all the things that happened to me and thinking, well, uh, if people know about reincarnation, uh, they might just kill themselves if they don't like their life and start over. But uh, if they listen to the whole idea behind reincarnation, the reason for it being it's to learn and to keep on going. So uh, if you're in a really hard spot, uh, it's for your benefit and just keep plugging through and doing the best you can. And life is such a precious gift for our souls to continue learning that that's really truly what it's all about. Absolutely. Well, Nancy, thank you once again. Uh, once again, we're out of time, but uh, thank you so much for um, doing these two shows about your uh, incredible experiences. Tell the listeners once again how they can find your website and your book. Yes, I am at Nancy Van Alphen, V-A-N-A-L-P-H-E-N dot com. And my book is Caught Between Heaven and Earth, and it's uh, on Amazon dot com and barnesandnoble.com. And I just want to put one little uh, plug in here, if I can, Lee, for the IONS Book Club, which I'm a host of. And I'll be speaking a little more about my book um, because I'm featured in one of the sessions. But if your listeners are interested in reading these books, which they can really get a lot of details out of, they can check out isgo.ions.com. That's I-S-G-O dot 
IANDS.com as well. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's real important uh, that we're all out there telling our stories because the more people hear, the more that opens them up and sets them on their own journeys or further along on their own paths. That's terrific. Well, thank you so much again, Nancy. Yeah. For the listeners, for more about IANDS, go to IANDS.org. And tune in again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening. <laughs>